Hello everybody, in this video we're going to be talking a little bit about Lagrange multipliers. So if some of you are cringing right now, that's because you're probably a student of economics or stats or linear algebra and you find yourself constantly having to use these but not really remembering the theory behind them. So in this video I will not be getting into the theory because I think it's a little bit heavy to get into that right now. But we're going to be talking about how to use Lagrange multipliers, uh, when you know it's time to use the Lagrange multiplier. Um, and considerations like that. So we're going to be talking more about the how to execute a Lagrange multiplier problem and less about the theory. We may make a theory video in the future, but that's just not what this particular video will be about. All right, so here's the setup. We are explorers of a new land and our goal is to discover new species. So all of our team is right here at the origin and of course we uh, put a U1, U2 grid, so that's the two basic directions and of course we can go in any direction that's a combination of U1 and U2. The question is which direction should we go in to increase our success of finding a new species. Let's say our chief biologist, super smart guy, has devised this formula for us which tells us uh, based on which direction we go in, based on the U1 and U2 components of the direction we are choosing to go in, it tells us our success of finding a new species, right? And we want to, of course, maximize the success because we want to go in the direction that's giving us the most success of finding a new species. The formula is given by U transpose S U, where S is a two by two matrix, one, negative one, three, one, and U is simply the direction we're choosing to go in. So it's a two by one vector with the U one and U two component of the direction we're choosing to go in. Now I'm not going to go over all the computations which lead us from U transpose SU to what that formula is algebraically because um, I think based on the mul matrix multiplication type operations we've done in past videos, you can do that, I'm confident. But in the end we find that if we find the closed form algebraic uh, solution after doing all these vector matrix multiplications, it's equal to U1 plus U2 squared. So we want to find the direction that maximizes this. Seems simple enough, maybe we can just do a calculus problem, but there's something fishy going on already, right? Let's say we choose to go in this direction right here with this U1 and this U2. We plug those into the formula and we get some number. Now let's say we double those components and we go to U1 and to U2. Now our answer shouldn't change, right? Our success should not change because we end up going in the same direction. We just chose to represent that with an arrow that was double the magnitude. But it ends up that if we put 2u1 in here and 2u2 in here, then the 2 can get factored out. It gets squared, of course, and we end up with four times the amount of success. That doesn't really make any sense, right? Um, we don't want that to happen because if we were to do a uh, traditional calculus problem, a traditional maximization problem on this, it would tell us to set u1 and u2 as both as positive infinity. Because if we do that, we're going to get infinity as our success, and that's amazing, but that doesn't help us understand which direction we're supposed to go in, right? So it becomes pretty clear here pretty fast that we need some form of constraint. We need to make sure that we're not allowing any possible U1 and U2 values. That constraint is going to be that we're only going to allow, let me make a little bit of room here, cancel some of these things out, we're only going to allow any U1, U2 combination which lies on the unit circle. Another way of saying that is if this vector U is the one we're choosing to go in, we need the magnitude of vector U to be equal to one. That is the same thing as saying it lies on the unit circle. Because that means that all we're caring now is about the direction we're going in. We no longer care about the magnitude of that vector because we set the magnitude of that vector. In fact, we could have set it as any number, it's just one is the most convenient to use in mathematical operations. And now you also see why I call these vectors u, because I knew that we were going to set the magnitude equal to 1, so I just called them u for a unit vector. Okay, so that is the constraint. Let's write it a little bit more formally mathematically, and then we'll talk about how Lagrange multipliers come in and help us solve our problem. Okay, so our problem, after the constraint is taken into account, ends up being this guy. We want to maximize u transpose su, because that's our measure of success based on our super smart scientist friend. But now, Subject to, so ST stands for subject to or such that, it basically says, given the constraint this, the constraint being U transpose U is equal to 1. Now that looks slightly different than the constraint I gave before. Uh, before I was saying I want magnitude of U to be equal to 1, but 
u transpose u is just the magnitude of the vector u squared, and 1 squared is just 1. Okay, so this is really the same constraint. Um, you can verify that for yourself as well. Well, I can just give you a quick verification. U transpose U, since U only has two elements, U1 and U2, U transpose U is going to be U1 squared plus U2 squared. And that's the same thing as the square of the magnitude of U, because it's given by the same formula. Okay, cool. So that's our constraint. Now, here is how you actually use a Lagrange multiplier. You go ahead and write your objective function, the function you're trying to maximize or minimize, u transpose s u. You do plus lambda, lambda being the actual Lagrange multiplier itself. And then you go ahead and take your constraint, move everything onto one side of the equal sign. So we get 1 minus u transpose u. OK, so this is our new function. And we basically treat this as an unconstrained problem. We have already internalized the constraint. We have taken the constraint and put it into this new formula so that now we can go ahead and just operate on this guy like we would a normal calculus problem. We just take the derivative and set it equal to 0. OK, so let's do that. Let me clear some room on this side of the board. OK, so if I take the derivative of this guy, we know how to take matrix derivatives, right? If you don't, go ahead and watch the video on matrix derivatives that we have. That'll help you a lot in understanding what's about to happen. If we take the derivative of this guy, we saw this exact form in that video. So it's going to be 2, it's going to be 2 s u. If we take the derivative of this guy, the lambda is a constant. So we're going to get minus lambda, the minus coming from here. And the derivative of u transpose u is just given by 2 times u. Set that equal to 0. A lot of simplifications we can make. We have a 2 here that can go away, a 2 here that can just go away. Let's move the lambda u over to that side so we get s u is equal to lambda u. Now this is really cool and let me tell you why. What does this look like to you? This is of course the equation of a eigenvector. Because remember, any eigenvector of matrix s is going to satisfy the formula s u, u being the eigenvector, is equal to some scalar multiple lambda of the vector u. So we have found that u, any direction we're going in on the uh, plane, has to be an eigenvector of matrix S. That's already a powerful statement. So now we're only able to consider eigenvectors of matrix S. Of course, the question is, which eigenvector of matrix S should we use? Because it's going to have potentially a few of them, right? To figure that out, we're going to do another fancy trick. That fancy trick being we're going to go ahead and left multiply each side of this equation by u transpose. So we're going to get u transpose s u is equal to lambda u transpose u. And what is u transpose u? Well, it has to be equal to 1. We know that. We said it. So that means that we can just get rid of u transpose u. My board's obviously not erasing as well as I want it to, but that's gone. So we find that u transpose s u is equal to lambda. Why is that significant? Because the thing we're trying to maximize in the beginning was u transpose s u, which is the thing right here. If we're trying to maximize this, and this thing is equal to lambda, we're also trying to basically find the maximal lambda. But what is lambda? From our previous step, we saw that lambda is an eigenvalue of uh, matrix S. So we basically just want to take all the eigenvalues of matrix S and find the biggest one. Because if we find the biggest eigenvalue, that's going to maximize lambda, that's going to maximize this, and that's exactly what we want in the first place. So it's a little bit of mathematical gymnastics to get from here back to there back to there. But hopefully you can see from uh, these calculations we've done that if I were to pick the biggest eigenvalue, lambda, of matrix S and then find its corresponding eigenvector, u, that's going to be the direction I need to head in in order to have the highest measure of success based on my constrained maximization problem. And that's how you use Lagrange multipliers. That's about it. They just come in when you have a maximization or minimization problem. But you also want to set some kind of constraint so things don't get out of control. You basically take that constraint, you internalize it into the problem, and then you go ahead and you take your derivative as you always would. OK? Um, and that is about it. That's how, you, that's how you use a Lagrange multiplier. OK? And we're going to be using this in our principal component analysis video. So until next time.